All right. We are streaming and recording. All right. I'd like to call to order the city, uh, the city of the whole city council meeting uh, with the acting city manager. Please call the roll. Um, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. Leroy. Here. Um, Ms. Everett. Here. Ms. Stancorp Taylor. Here. And Mayor Hoffmeister. Here. You get everybody? Uh, looks like uh, Zach is not on yet. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, the first order of business is the uh, high discussion and hiring of the city manager. We have a guest host. I mean, a guest here with us uh, from the uh, school board, which we're very happy to see. And so I know she has some time commitments. So I would like to turn it over to her <laughs> and to hear her, um, I wouldn't say dissertation, but discussion on what they went through <laughs> in the hiring of the uh, uh, superintendent. Great. Well, thank you all for having me. And um, Rusty is going to share some slides that hopefully you all can each have and kind of take with you. Um, the idea is not to kind of go into all the whys that we chose who we did, but just to tell you a little bit about our process. And if you can glean anything from it that helps you in the search for city manager, um, the school board be really happy about that. So um, I want to start with this first slide here with this nice picture called the finish line. Um, so as you can see, I just want to let you know up front, it's a happy ending, um, <laughs> at least according to the Board of Education. This is actually Tim Weber with the board and our treasurer Rhonda Johnson in July at our retreat in July of 19, which when we get to the timeline, I'll show you that was the last thing on my timeline. Um, but it was it was quite a process to get to that point. We started in early fall with the announcement of the retirement of Sue Lang. And we really spent the fall kind of in that planning phase. But the first thing we did was pick our date and we said, we would like to have prior to spring break an announcement of our next superintendent, which kind of for us landed us around mid-March. So from that point, we then worked backwards. Um, the first thing that we did, okay, Rusty, you can go on to the next slide, is the board as individuals, the five of us, we on our own individually kind of worked on a list of traits and qualifications, what we would like to see in the next superintendent. And then we met, we came back together, we met as a group and we really worked through several iterations um, of a document that I have attached um, in uh, the next slide. But really the idea of this, we kind of called it just our guiding document. And we had a thought that we would like to hire a search firm. And we wanted this document to really help the search firm know who we were as a board. We also wanted to understand each other where we were as a board. And um, we knew that we, we had all agreed very early on that we wanted to do a very good job of engaging the community. We wanted a lot of buy-in. And when I say community, I really mean all of our stakeholders, how we define our stakeholders. Um, teachers, parents of students, students, administration, empty nesters, pre-nesters, everybody who has a stake in our schools, um, community organizations, city council, city leaders. Um, we knew that the information that we would get from engaging the community would certainly augment what we put together in this document and it might change, it might have certain priorities rise to the surface which it certainly did all that. But just so you know up front, the very first thing we did was put together, um, and Rusty, you can go to that next slide. Um, and I kind of just, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I just wanted you to see what we ended up putting together, the five of us sitting down um, 
obviously we we had to have a lot of discussion but we were all really very like-minded and um, the things for us that really rose to the surface we could group into the areas of leadership and communication so you'll find that a lot of our bullets ended up in that but we talked about certain things like is it important that this person have a phd is it you know like there were certain things is it a, is it a requirement that they live in wyoming there are some specifics that we did sort of hammer out in our discussions as a board um but this is a, the guiding document and you can read it as you will okay rusty um after we put together this um and you can click one more get on up there we go um the next thing that we decided to do, and we spent a good amount of time in October, November, even getting into early December, um, deciding on a search firm and then really putting a lot of feelers out there. We used our um, organization, Ohio School Boards Association meeting to put out feelers. We actually, at that meeting, interviewed um, a couple of different search firms, um, but we we at first we kind of were worried that hiring a search firm oh it might be cost prohibitive, you know um, it wasn't something that Wyoming schools typically did when they hired a superintendent, um, but as you can see here we really had some reasons why we wanted to do it and in the end we were really very happy not only with the cost it was quite reasonable. Um, but we really wanted to increase the professionalism of the search process um, just overall and really in the eyes of candidates looking at Wyoming as well. Um, hiring a search firm allowed us, um, allowed the process to be a little more confidential for interested candidates. You know, the goal being we wanted to have the best candidates possible. Um, and really one of the primary reasons we were excited about the search firm we eventually went with was their experience and ability to help us do a kind of a, a broad reach into the um, engagement of stakeholders. So, um, and, and often, you know, the, the kind of search firm, and Rusty, if you don't mind going to the next slide, um, our search firm, and I'm not sure if this would be the case with you as city managers, but with regard to school superintendents, there are search firms that specialize in selecting these you know, specific kind of leaders. And um, HYA, the group that we went to, if you went to any community discussions, you probably met Ken and Jane, who were the, the two, uh, form, their former superintendents, um, they have lots of experience, not only as superintendents, but also in the hiring of superintendents, private schools, public schools, small districts, large districts. So um, we went with them because of their references um, from schools that we thought a lot of their leadership. Um, they had a lot of experience with like districts um, and we knew we had a pretty tight timeline and they were able to work with that and they just really knew what they were doing and it, it was just going to add to the professionalism of what we wanted to do. Um, the other thing that that was important is um, they allowed the community engagement to focus not just on one type of engagement, but we did a, a survey, an online survey, we did focus groups, and they were also able to vet candidates. So. That, um, again, was immensely helpful. Okay, Rusty. And just to go a little bit through the, um, the timeline, um, as you can see, you know, we announced the search, we planned for the search, um, October, November, early December. Um, Mid-December, we made a public announcement um, and we had a planning session with our search firm. And um, again, position widely advertised in December. We were again, cert, you know, really trying to get that initial push out before the holidays. 
Um, and, um, but we had to immediately kind of move into, we knew when, if we wanted to hire in March, we had to work backward and think about when our interviews would be. So then we knew if we we're going to get feedback and use this feedback, we had to move kind of quickly on doing an online survey. Um, and luckily our search firm had, um, uh, um, which I'll get into a little bit more about that, um, had a survey that, that we used. Um, and then we allotted three days for the focus group sessions. And I'll talk a little more about that. Um, our CAC also conducted a community-wide forum. And then, um, so after all of this input, um, there was a very tight turnaround. Um, our search firm put together a leadership profile that uh, analyzed all the results of the survey, the stakeholder sessions, um, in a pretty comprehensive report. It may still be up on our, our website. I'm not sure of that. It was up on the website for a while, um, this leadership profile report, but it was presented to the board at a public meeting. We even had some citizens attend and um, a, lot of, a lot of interest in, in this aspect of things. Um, Late February, the initial slate was presented to the board. Um, we conducted initial interviews and all five of us participated over the course of basically what amounted to two full days. So probably a lot of our work was just coordinating our calendars. Um, so early March, um, we then very quickly moved to identify our semifinalist and um, we narrowed down to three and we had semi-finalist interviews you can see over March 6th, 10th and 12th. We then had a very quick turnaround to discuss our final three candidates and um, that was on March 14th. And then very quickly we moved to announce um, our selection as uh, Tim Weber. Um, so that looking back on it, I realized what a very tight time frame that really was. <laughs> and, um, but I think it was doable because um, we tied as much as we could to existing board meetings that were already scheduled that our, you know, our group clears the calendar for. And, um, you know, probably a little easier to get a group of five than your bigger group. Um, you know, calendars all coordinated. Somehow we were able to do it. I don't, I don't know how, honestly, but uh, it did work out. I wanna talk just a little bit more about the um, stakeholder survey. So if we could go to the next slide. So the, the first thing we did to <clears throat> engage the community was the survey. And you can see that, um, we sent it out as widely as we could, um, had a, close to a thousand respond. Um, and we kind of focused the questions. There weren't any open-ended questions on this online survey. Acting um, manager. And so I guess oh. what you have to do is just wait. Nancy's on, but oh. I don't know anybody. <laughs> Hold on, let me uh, figure okay. out how to. I thought maybe somebody was asking a question. Yep. Well, she just. How sitting. do I? Does anybody know how to mute everybody? Um. Bobby Strangfeld. Oh, Sherry's not on. I'm the only one. Everyone, just please mute mute their um. Let me. The okay. for some phone because we can hear you. Um. Look at the invitation. For the, is there any phone number for um, for Rusty? Rusty, can you go to participants? And yeah, then... I just did it. I just muted everybody. Okay. There you go, Karen. Right. Okay, Sorry great. No, no problem. And please, anybody interrupt me if you have a question. I'm just sort of blowing through this because I want to be conscious of your time. But um, the online stakeholder survey, um, 
it was not open-ended. So we kind of um, had two categories, uh, asked people to sort of rate this, how they felt about the state of the district. And then, um, and it encompassed different areas related to vision, teaching, community engagement, and like financial management. Um, the other thing was a leadership profile. And from a list of 12 characteristics, we asked respondents to choose their top four statements that uh, were most important in selecting a superintendent. Um, and I didn't wanna go through all of that with you, but I do have that if you're interested, you know, each category, for example, state of the district, you know, in vision, it would say something like the district is heading in the right direction. And you would um, say one for strongly disagree all the way up to five strongly agree. Um, the district provides a clear, compelling vision for the future. The district has high standards for student performance um, and teaching and learning. Um, the district provides a well-rounded education. District schools are safe. The social and emotional needs of students are being addressed. Technology is integrated into the classroom. Um, community engagement, um, we ask people to rate, rate, there is transparent communication from the district. Uh, the district engages the community as a partner to improve the school system. Um, in management, the district is fiscally responsible. Um, employees are held accountable to high standards. Facilities are well maintained. So you kind of get the idea of the things we were asking people to analyze. Um, some of the quality leadership profile, um, the statements that we asked people to rank. Um, let's see someone who fosters a positive professional climate of mutual trust and respect among, among faculty, staff, and administrators, um, someone who understands and can be sensitive to the needs of a diverse student population, um, demonstrates a deep understanding of educational research and emerging best practices, someone who can be visible throughout the district and actively engage in community life, transparent communication, et cetera. Um, the top um, of the top four, the most, um, I guess, popular answer was someone who fosters a positive professional climate of mutual trust and respect among faculty, staff, and administrators. Um, so it, it, it was actually quite interesting to, to, and we were grateful for HYA's ability to analyze all of this data. So um, Rusty, you can move on to the next one. The stakeholder sessions, the focus groups. Um, we asked the focus groups all the same questions um, just for consistency. Um, what is going well? What are the challenges? What traits would you like to see in your next superintendent? Um, what questions would you ask of your next superintendent? Is there someone you would recommend? And when uh, the search firm uh, suggested adding that, I thought, why would people, why would they ask who would you write? But it was really interesting. Um, you know, there are a lot of people with, uh, who have some knowledge in this area. So it was interesting. Um, but the focus groups uh, we had, if I, we did about almost 60 sessions over the course of three days. And the search firm says, you have us all day for these three days, morning till night. And I think if they had to do it again, I don't know that they were expecting us to make use of every second of the time they made available to us. And we probably burned them out somewhat, but um, if they had to do it over again, I don't know that they would offer up that many sessions with that many different groups of people. And for your purposes, I don't know that that may have been a, I mean, we're really pleased with it, but that may have been a tad much. Um, 
60 different sessions. And, you know, we just really wanted to give people multiple opportunities for participation. And we kind of wanted to see if, if different themes would emerge. And they did. Different priorities rose to the top and it was quite informative, especially as we headed into the interview process. A lot of our questions began to center around um, trying to hire someone that could address what we saw as some of the issues that rose to the top. Um, we did have help from our CAC. We had the two um, search firm folks primarily conducting it. Um, they would have multiples. They One could, would conduct at the same time another one would. So we might have two sessions going at the same time. Um, but we really, um, and you can see there are all the different ways that we try to engage stakeholders in a small group way. Um, you all may do it different. You may do it by voting precinct. You may do it by age group. Um, I don't know all the different ways that you all would want to do it, but you know our stakeholders are are quite varied. So um, it was just a, a really interesting way to do it. And then our CAC put together a community forum that was a little bit different in nature, but really did help inform, um, again, once we got to the interview um, part of things. Rusty, you can move to that next slide. Um, this was more focused on, as you can see here, the long-term direction of the schools and kind of getting at our community values. Just um, trying to take it all in, I guess, as we look to the future and um, it, it was a really engaging um, discussion from reports. Uh, the CAC did a nice summary for us and um, we continue to use that document to this day. Um, and I think when Tim Weber did come, he has found a lot of the feedback from the focus groups in the community forum really helpful. And it, it kind of helped him start with both feet running for sure. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. So the um, HYA, um, as I mentioned, after the online survey and the focus groups, they put together a, a, a leadership profile report. As you can see, it was quite in depth. They explained the methodology they used they did a really in-depth analysis of the online survey, um, as well as the comments and suggested questions from all of the different focus groups. And a lot of the questions were just excellent and, and were helpful to us as we um, went through the interview process with the candidates. Um, and this was something that has, you know, was made public, the discussions were, you know, made public. So, you know, our goal was to be transparent and to really listen to the community. Um, okay. So in terms of the interviews, I mentioned we had two rounds. Um, in both rounds, all board members participated. Um, that first interview, I believe, was an hour and a half to two hour interview with the entire board. Um, and we asked each candidate the same 20 questions. Each board member was assigned a set of four questions ahead of time. And we just kind of went through, we, we tried to be very mindful of our time. Um, and then the second round was um, with the three finalists was a dinner interview, again, with all board members and um, a breakfast following the next day with just two board members. And that was a really, we were really pleased um, with getting to know the candidates that way. And as you can see here, I just thought I'd give you some of the sample interview questions that we had. Um, they're kind of standard, um, but again, um, many people in our stakeholder focus groups um, had 
reoccurring questions that popped up over and over again. And so those for sure found their ways and found their way into the discussion with um, our candidates. Okay, so the next slide I think is my last slide. Um, and all of this led to Mr. Tim Weber, who we just think is a, just an incredible leader, excellent superintendent, he, I don't know that we could have like just dreamed of finding somebody that was such a perfect fit for Wyoming and what we are looking for at this point in time. Um, but I just uh, can't say enough about the help that the search firm gave us and um, just being able to, um, I guess bond with our fellow board members over the course of this and really um, go through the process of listening to one another, listening to the community. Um, I think we had an advantage in that we um, really trust one another. And I really think that led to us getting our, our perfect fit for the school district. And as you can see, he really loves kids and um, he just, great leader. So we're excited to have him and I'm sure you guys will be just as successful. Are there any questions? Could you describe for us the approximate uh, investment in this process? How much did it cost? And did you have different quotes from the different search firms that were significantly out of line? Um, we did put the, um, I guess, put it out to bid, if you will. We got quotes from maybe four or five different search firms. There weren't, th the way they did it was there were different levels. You could choose like package A, package B or C, and they had increasing levels of um, cost part of the cost would involve like how much you brought the search firm people like they're in Illinois. And if every time they came to Cincinnati, that would be a cost. So some things we did, we would do um, remotely, um, even though it was before the days that we were all super comfortable with that. Um, but they did work into their initial bid certain days. We will be there for the stakeholder sessions. We will be there for the leadership profile report, that sort of thing. So um, it, it was pretty easy to compare apples to apples um, in terms of the different search firms, but we did learn um, that not all search firms do all that you may want them to do. Um, I don't remember any being way out of line and I would quote you on a price that it costs, but I, I will have to get back to you on that because I don't want to tell you an incorrect number, especially in a, in a public meeting like this. But what we found initially was when we were thinking about a search firm, just without investigating it, we we're told, oh, it could cost anywhere like $100,000. It'll be way cost prohibitive. And we we decided like, well, let's just investigate because other school districts have used search firms. And, um, and then when we got to it, it was nowhere near that. Um, and so I, it's not something you wanna dismiss out of hand until you actually investigate what a search firm offers. And um, my memory is that they were all really pretty competitive. So for us, it came down to um, references. Okay, a follow-up question. Was there a difference in the expectation of salary by the three finalists? Um, Did you ask the finalists, what is your expectation for yes. superintendent? Yes, we did ask that. Um, and again, my memory was there was, 
there was nobody out of line. There, there was no wild difference. Um, and I don't know how city manager that, that world is, but school superintendents generally, no, I, I don't think there's a, there'd be an expectation going into it, um, you know, and um, knowledge of what we had, had paid our former superintendent and, you know, that sort of thing. Are you satisfied then that you got value for the money that you invested in the search process relative to what you could have had otherwise? Oh my gosh, Jim, absolutely. Um, and I didn't go into it with the idea of like, oh, we've got to have a search firm because we can't do it ourselves. It was, it was more, um, we want to do this right. We want to engage the community. We want to be transparent. We want people to be, uh, we want the best fit for Wyoming. And we were all so like-minded that we were just open-minded to looking at a search firm. And then when we got into it and, and, I, and, and to say that we had, we were open to it, you know, as often things in Wyoming, you kind of stick with tradition, let's do the way it's always been done or whatever. And there's, it's gone well. And we wanted to be open to a search firm even though we hadn't traditionally done that. Um, I can't say they never did, but um, to my knowledge um, in recent past, it had not been done that way. Um, but we were just open to the idea of it. And then when we investigated it, we said, gosh, this, especially when we looked at the, the, the cost of doing it. Um, and I can't get you that information, Jim. I just, off the top of my head, I, I just, don't want to tell you the a wrong figure, but um, it was well, well worth the money, um, especially because I feel like we did get our right fit. We presented ourselves professionally. Uh, we learned a lot about what goes into hiring someone at this level. And we were able to have two more people in the process who are former superintendents who have helped districts from all over the country with their searches so we weren't like flying blind at all we had a lot of expertise to rely on plus we had each other and our knowledge of the district to combine um, but I think their ability to engage the community um, and the strong references they had from other districts was a big big selling point for us thank you Kara sure uh, Kara, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, sorry, I'm having my issues. Um, so I really like the idea of using a method that presents the city and city council in as professional a manner as we can. But I also, I as someone who went to all of these, all, I went to like two of your listening sessions, I felt like as a parent, I got a lot out of being part of the process. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit on, on the after, the after you hired Tim Weber, what sort of response you got from the community if people felt like the things they had brought up in the sessions were reflected in the choice that you made. Yeah, I, I would say that um, you know the, the board members did not participate. I mean, we each talked to, we talked and had our own individual interviews with the search firm, but we did not participate in the um, community, the stakeholder sessions because we wanted people to feel very free to be honest and and say what they felt and. Um, I, there was so much positive feedback that in our, in our search, the, the search firm, the two people, Ken and Jane, Ken Arndt and Jane Westerhold, they told us this person that you need to hire. I mean, they got so attached to the people they talked to, um, that they would come to us and say, you know, there was this one particular group, they said, whoever you hire, 
a lot of what needs to happen with this, you know, particular group is, is really listening. And we were able to, you know, once Tim was hired, you know, we had all of these notes, all of this feedback to share with him. And then we knew given that we needed someone who was authentic and sincere and warm and could make decisions, not a people pleaser. Like we got such a strong sense from the, the theme of these many focus groups, even if they were different about different subjects, we knew we needed someone that would true, like have it, like empathy was a big thing, not just listening, but empathizing. Um, but yet someone who could take that discern and take it in and make a decision in the best interest of kids. And so he was so grateful for all the feedback and then was able, given the kind of person that he is, um, was able to launch right into his uh, community discussions. And I don't know if you remember right when we hired him, he basically opened up and we didn't ask him to do this. I mean, he just knew, I will talk to anyone who wants to talk to me um get your group together and I'll come and talk with a group and he did that he made himself available to faculty over the course of the summer before he had even started um, when he was an in interim and then certainly into that first minute you know come by and schedule a time to talk with me and he moved here um it wasn't a requirement but we certainly were very excited that he wanted to live and be a part of the community. And, um, I, you know, I, I think the feedback just, it dovetail right into uh, what he wanted to do. Um, it dovetailed into the kind of person that he is and would be meaningful information to him. So in my opinion, I do think that people appreciated it. I mean, we did hear a lot about um, people feeling heard with regards to hiring Tim. And um, it just provided so much information for Tim going into it. Um, and it definitely cemented, you know, a lot of things that we came up with in our guiding document, we said, okay, yes, this is really important okay, maybe this is not as important. I mean, some things definitely came through up to the surface through all of those different sessions. Very helpful, thank you. I just Other wanna questions? say, oh, I just wanna say Kara that, and to people on the board that don't have kids in the schools that I think Tim is a fantastic superintendent. Um, I'm so pleased that, first of all, that you did such a thorough and inclusive way of searching for a superintendent, but you found someone who's just, um, you know, I don't have a ton of experience with him, but I just was always amazed that he would show up at cross country meets and, um, and that he moved here and he's just very approachable and he's a great communicator to parents, which I appreciate. Um, so thank you for doing all that hard work. Yeah. Oh, well, I appreciate you saying that. And we, I can't tell you the five of us together, like when it became clear that Tim was, I mean, it, it just, we knew he was the perfect fit, but as time has gone on, um, I think we've all grown to admire him even more than we even knew that we could like he's a better fit than even we imagined and he we thought he was a great fit <laughs> so um and i don't just say that because he's uh our guy i say that because i've witnessed him in action time and time again through as you know we've all experienced many difficult situations and um but i i think we were able to do that because of the time that we took together. And it was just absolutely critical that we all get on the same page in terms of not all having the exact same opinion as, as board members, but we were all like-minded in that uh, we really uh, 
you know, through our guiding document, had a very clear vision of what we wanted in a leader. And um, we just got so lucky that he happened to be uh, the person that he is and the really just the right fit for our community. I mean, just the fact that he would move here and embrace the idea of the smaller district and, um, you know, he is very warm and approachable, but I do find him to be uh, decisive and uh, discerning, um, you know, and I think that's important in a leader as well, um, because you get lots of varying opinions in a community, and uh, a lot of people make valid points about a lot of different things, and you have to take it all in and keep at the forefront of your mind what's best for kids and our situation as, as a school district. So I, I would say that we are, we are really pleased. The only thing in our process that I would change, I would definitely go with the search firm. The only thing I would change is probably doing 60 focus groups over the course of three days. <laughs> that, that's about the only thing that I think, oh, we could have probably tweaked that a bit. Um, but I actually, in the end, think the tight timeline was advantageous because I think the candidates liked things moving along and it kept us very focused. Kara, I wanna thank you so much for your, um, for your time and your presentation. It's, it's highly professional. It's, yeah, you, got, you did a wonderful job and I wanna tell you how much I appreciate it. You did answer my one question um, about the, the number of opportunities you had to talk to people, would you reduce that down? Uh, oh. <laughs> one, you, one of the questions I had is you did have a, uh, you had a, a short timeline. Was that timeline due to uh, hiring practices in the school business? Uh, and, uh, and do you wish you had a little more time to, than you did to be able to, uh, to again, stretch those three days out, maybe to four days, or have more of a, of a thought process? You know, so to answer the first part of your question, yes, it was in large part due to the nature of hiring and when things become available, um, when people have to sign their contracts and commit to their district and things like that. Um, I, I definitely am, ha I'm happy in this, from the standpoint that we were able to get it advertised right before the uh, holiday break. Um, I think that was kind of critical to get that out there. The search firm was able to help kind of use their connections as well. And um, we were able to kind of plant seeds around and ask around and and talk to other districts and that sort of thing in terms of um, the, it, we had time to plan, but um, kind of looking at it, like I said, I don't know quite how we made that work with five people's schedules, but in the end, I, I think it was just a really appropriately tight timeline. Um, it depends how many candidates you want to start with. And then like, I felt like, having seven, I think it was six or seven that we started with our, as our semifinalist and then narrowing it down to three felt right for us. Um, and I don't know if that would be the same when you're working with a city manager, but because we started with seven, six or seven, and then three, it was very doable over the course of those days. And in a way it kept us, it fresh in our minds. And I think having those discussions, like we interviewed people over the course of, I think it was a Friday night and all day Saturday, that first group. And then on Sunday, we met as a board to discuss those initial uh, candidates. And so everything was very fresh. And, um, but I think, you know, for us, it was great for the search firm who were like having to turn it around and notify the candidates and, and get their, you know, <laughs> I think it was hard for them. So we definitely, Jim, the money that we paid, we made them earn every penny of it <laughs> because we were, had a very, um, 
I mean, we were very responsive with them, but we did have a tight timeline and every second they offered to us, we took. Um, and I, I don't know that I would change any of that. It just depends your stamina for, you know, meeting all day over the course of two days. Um, I didn't find it to be bad at all. Um, and I quite liked, I mean, it was, you can see in our semi-finalist interviews, we had March 6th, 10th, and 12th. So we did space those out a couple of days. And that probably was a good idea because you don't want the poor candidate number three, you don't want to have fatigue and talking to someone, um, you know, just because they were on March 12th. But overall, I, I was pretty happy with, I don't think it was by design other than we felt like we wanted to have this wrapped up before spring break. Um, but as it worked out, I, I was pretty pleased with that. Thank you, Karen. Good work Thank on your you. part. Oh, it was a, a group effort for sure. But I wish you guys all the luck in the world. Um, I think you're going to do great. And um, I just uh, hope you have the same um, access to um, help that we did in terms of being able to engage the community and all of that. But anyway, I wish you lots of luck. I probably guess I should, if there are no more questions, maybe sign off so I can get to our board meeting, um, which does, I guess, start Thank you very soon. much. Thanks, Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the next the next question I have are do how do folks feel about um, hiring consultants? Is everyone on board with that? Against that, I'd like to hear from folks on what you what your views on the, using a consultant. Um, I guess I hear first. I think it's an excellent idea. Um, I think it shows a level of professionalism, which hopefully will attract someone to match that level. Um, what she described, even with the help of a search team, is going to be a whole lot of work for all of us. And if we try to do that absent all of the back end work that the search team was doing, I, I fear this could drag on for a very, very long time. Um, I know we have cost um, to balance. So I think we need to get some bids and have some idea of what we would be asking of them going into it. But I, I'm in support of doing, of using a search group. Others? Al and I have gone through this three times now or four times out. And uh, certainly a search firm would streamline the process. When we were in Kansas City, I guess it was, you were one of the finalists, uh, the city where I mean, one of the finalists for the National League of Cities Award. You had an opportunity to see more uh, potential uh, city managers from some of the areas. It is probable that we won't get as diverse a group as we would like unless we have a city manager of uh, public administration experience firm. If we have a public experience, public administration experience firm that's done it before, we'd look at their credentials and consider their cost and their credentials before signing. That'd be my view. Others? I had a question for Jim and Al, and that is Kara talked about surveying the community. And I understand that for a school board superintendent. In the past, have you done any type of surveying regarding city manager? Yes, every other November, we get a survey <laughs> result that tells us we are or are not doing what the public wants. In the case of parents, of school children, it's probable that you want to have more in-depth awareness of what people want in their schools, what their expectations are. We get a, a crude response uh, every other year that it's quite intriguing. Al, what are your thoughts? Uh, no, we have not formally, we have not formally surveyed. Um, what we have done in the past, which we're kind of fortunate, um, I am for a survey, let me just put that out front. 
uh, we've always used the uh, long our long range master plan. The, that the we have been. Let me give you just a quick history. What had happened to us is that we were doing our master plan on an internal. We were all doing it inside administratively for a period of time, and we found out that. Uh, by bringing in, uh, uh, we asked a question about a professionalism, and it, I'm going to get to the answer. When we brought a professional team from the outside in, we had a broader perspective, a much more professional presentation, and we were able to, they, uh, what they were able to do is draw from the community thoughts and ideas that we would have never been able to do. Only one, one because obviously we're city council. And, and two, us being in the room created that kind of uh, position. So we learned from that, from long range master plans and we have used them, as you know, we've used them to guide our city from that point. And, there, and the best benefit of that was that we had a broader perspective from our community and we had a larger input from our community. So, that, so the answer is, I think that uh, surveying uh, we haven't done, but the but the master plan allowed us to do that, and I do think for us it would be beneficial for us to have to establish a survey of of some point, and particularly about what characteristics do you find to be important. You had an exceptional city manager. What are the cap characteristics that made her exceptional, and do you want to carry that to the next level? So um, a long answer to a short question. Thank you. Well, I'll just weigh in and say, um, I think community input is really important, especially, um, you know, we've heard from some residents over the summer with concerns about diversity and inclusion. And um, I know the schools face that as well. That was a concern from some parents and, um, so that's an issue. I would I would definitely want to hear about that from the community. Of course, I'd want to hear everybody's thoughts on what they see as a good city managers, and and I think it's it's just good for the community to talk about because we we kind of play the ugly stepchild to the school district in some ways. People don't pay as much attention always, um, but we people need to know what their city manager does and and. Um, it's, it's good for them to think and talk about it, I think. Um, and it's certainly um, whoever we hire, if people don't like them, um, you know, if we've done it in a way that we've been very inclusive with the community, they're not gonna point the finger at us. Um, I mean, I certainly expect we'll hire someone great that people will like, but I'm just saying that that's something to keep in mind too. Um, and I'm definitely for um, hiring a search firm I know that this is not a time that the city has, is flush with cash, but um, I think if if you spend the money up front and that brings you um, in the end, you get this fantastic person. It's well worth it in the long run because that person is going to save us money in ways we don't even know about yet because of their professionalism and their ability to communicate and. Um, so, um, yeah, those are my thoughts. Right. Jeff, do you want to chime in on whether or not to hire a consultant? No, I would agree with everything Nancy said and, and Al. I think a consultant will help. And, you know, with respect to the survey, I, I've always found it's better when you get people involved in the process because mm -hmm. even if you make a decision they don't agree with, they feel like they had a say. And I think it's important they do have a say. And if I think back to how much Lynn interacted with the community, I'd say it was probably more than, than any single one of us on any given day. And so it's important to make the right decision based on that person as a communicator an influencer and in the face of the city staff. Um, the one thing I would say is I, you know, I don't know how you do a survey if you do it of all, all residents, all homes, or if you just do it through town halls and it's an oral survey and interested people can come and give input. I, I don't know, but uh, I see Jim laughing at me, but. Uh, Not laughing at you, laughing with you. Oh, laughing with me, okay. 
But no, I, I would concur with what has been said previously. Okay. So the next steps are on this is we're going to send you material we have so far of the people who have solicited us. All right. Um, Rush is going to send that to everyone. You can look at the materials and say, hey, like, 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 don't like, don't like. And then if, if there's a consensus after you review these materials and you, and you want to go with one of these people, then at a, at a future meeting, we will go with one of these uh, groups. Or if there's not a consensus and people say, I don't like any of these people who solicited us already, or I want them to make a pitch to us or whatever, um, we'll go whichever way the, the, the group wants to. But at this stage right now, we're just going to give you information that says, hey, these are the folks that solicited us, review it, tell me what you think. All right, everybody tracking on that? All right, okay. Uh, now, now we have to move to the more uh, challenging and I'd argue more unpleasant um, uh, agenda item, which is uh, discuss the replacement of an irreplaceable, uh, something that uh, I know is going to be very uh, difficult to do. Um, but before I uh, start on that process, I wanted to turn it over to Jeff if he wanted to give some comments. Okay. Could, before you do that, I'm, I'm so sorry, Jeff, but we have people from UFBC here. Can we do that first? Just oh, I'm sorry. Did I, did, I, did I leap for? Okay, I'm sorry about that. Yes. I, I'm I sorry. I asked Rusty to switch things no, no. around, but no, I'm my sorry, fault. Jeff. <laughs> my fault. Um, we, we'll, we'll push it off something I don't want to do even further down the road. We'll kick the, we'll kick the can down the road as long as we still have Jeff here. Okay. And I will turn it over to uh, Mike. Is Mike Leopard going to start that? Rusty, you yeah. like that right? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I'd like to just begin with a, the obvious. Wyoming Bayou's trees, and you, you all know we've been a tree city USA for many, many years. And since I've been here 16 years, we've dealt with Emerald Ash Bore and this Urban Forestry Commission helped develop a plan. Uh, we've upped our tree management through diversity and communication. And now we have a city arborist. We got a tree, a street tree inventory now. So we constantly made improvements. And recently the Urban Forestry Commission took up tree protection during construction, documenting best practices for protecting street trees and other trees during construction. So before I turn it over to the commission, I just like this, my goal here today is to have them give the report and then I'd like to make a few comments on the end and then I'm sure we'd be available to answer any questions. But I did notice last I looked, there was six of our members on the call and I'd like to introduce them. There's Andrea Betts, Melissa Monick, our chairperson, Bobby Strangfeld, Kate Miller and Sean Creighton. And our first speaker today is Sherry Callahan. So please welcome Sherry. Don't mute it. Hi, Sherry. Uh, <laughs> I'm Sherry. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? All right. Um, like Mike said, um, I'm going to present uh, with Sean Creighton, and we are both members of this commission. I'm glad there's so many of us on the commission that are here tonight. Um, our goal is to present um, and for city council to accept our recommendations for tree protection on cons during construction projects. And I think you have those recommendations as a separate item in your email. Um, and Mike and Sean is actually gonna talk to those, um, but I wanted to kind of start with the history of the project and the approach we took um, on this. Um, and Rusty, do you have our slides? No. Um... So I have a, I have it. Do you, how do I, can you? I can make you the host and you can share your screen. Okay. I thought they were sent to you, so. There you go. So like I said, our goal is to present these and for you to accept them. We uh, recognize trees are an asset of the city. The city, like Mike said, plants over a hundred trees each year, and we have hey, been. Sherry, hey, Sherry do you want do you want to share your screen? Oh, all right. 
Um, Hey, Sharon, uh, there should be a button on the bottom of the screen there that uh, says share screen. It has like a little arrow on it. Yes. Or if somebody wants to email them to me, oh, there we go. So can you see them now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Keeps asking me if I want to stop the recording. No, don't stop the recording. I won't. <laughs> All right, so you can see the screens. I don't know if I can get them to be total. So hit hit enable editing. At the top, the little white button in the middle. All right, and I've got out of there. Can you see them? No, you'll have to share your screen again, Sherry. It went away. There you go. Okay. So are you, we're all seeing them now? Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, we recognize that trees are an asset to our city. Like Mike said, we we plant over 100 trees each year, and we have been a tree city for ever 15 years. And when we talk about city trees, we're talking about um, those trees along the street between the sidewalk and um, the street. We're also talking about those trees that are 10 feet um, in the right of way when there is no sidewalk. And we're talking about all the trees around the city buildings in the city parks. Our commission is providing guidelines for future construction projects in order to best protect all these trees. Trees are valued by the city and the residents. And today our efforts are made. Um, the public works team does have an effort right now to protect and preserve trees. Um, our recommend recommendations are really documenting some real steps that need to be in place for all future construction projects. Um, we recognize the trees um, and city progress and the preservation of trees sometimes can be in conflict. We all need new roads, beautiful new facilities, but it takes time for a large mature tree to be happen. Many city projects impact trees, starting with tree maintenance, there's normal pruning, there's replacement and planting new trees, and there's clearing storm damage. And there are many new city developments. Um, our commission has planted new trees along the bike path and at the recreation center as part of Make a Difference Day. And we all know that there's a new village green in the planning. But road construction has big impacts, both the state projects and the utility projects, the street repaving and the sidewalk all impact our trees. Um, yeah. So our recommendations support the master plan. Theme two of the master plan states a priority of the community is a, is a robust street tree program. And the recent survey said only 58% of the residents approve or are satisfied with this current program. And we asked the residents really know what this street program is. So having documented guidelines and recommendations are a way to improve this, doc this communication. Um, the, the Springfield Pike and Ritchie reconstruction projects are what prompted our commission to read to see the need for written communications. Springfield Pike was a state-run project. Ritchie was a city project. There were different contractors. 
Public Works knew that these projects were in the plans. So consequently, they planted no trees along these streets for the last several years, knowing there was gonna be an impact, knowing trees were gonna be lost. But the community only saw the pink ribbons. They were concerned that all these trees were coming down. Shortly before the, the, these road projects, a very mature tree in Hilltop Park along Riley Road needed to be removed. Residents came to our meetings for several months wanting to understand the process and the communication. We know there's future projects on the table. Mount Pleasant and Vermont are scheduled for road repairs and both streets have significant mature trees. Our recommendations are specific to construction projects and we want to see these written guidelines to help the communication with the residents because we know communication is key. The development of these recommendations was a learning process for all the members of the commission. We started with understanding the public works was doing and reviewing the Wyoming charter, chapter 900 of trees and shrubbery. A process was in place, but it's not so well documented. We had an outside consultant meet with us and she was able to review the current charter and our first draft of recommendations. She made the suggestions that we could enhance our wording and contractor accountability. The Ohio Department of Natural Resources who runs the Tree City USA program directed us towards several neighboring communities who had strong guidelines in place. One member of our commission, like Mike had said, did a whole tree inventory of all the, the city trees. This inventory will allow the city to consider significant trees and historical trees when projects come. And they will also look at trees that need for replacing. Our commission, we have an, um, an ISA certified arborist. We have two landscape, landscape architects and we have three master gardeners. They are able to direct us towards the industry standards and the best practices for tree protection and bring us a level of expertise to this project. All along the development in our do document, we were consulting with Public Works team, with Terry and Terry and Chuck, and they were, and we, and also Lynn and the city manager. Um, they support these recommendations. Um, looking at the timeline for this project, it's been going on a long time. A street tree subcommittee was formed because the, of the residents, residents' concern over tree removal and recent construction projects motivated our committee. Since the beginning of the project, communication with residents has improved. In, in October of 2018, a What's Up Wyoming article towards a healthier population was published. And in February of two, of, in the fall of 2019, a page was included on the city website, Your Trees, Our Trees. Now we have our recommendations for tree protection during construction projects. And I wanna then turn it over to Sean and let him talk about um, this, the specifics of the recommendations. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, good evening, everybody. So um, now that Sherry's given some of the background on um, kind of the effort that was put into developing this document, I wanna go over some of the more uh, specific details with you guys. Um, just to start off, um, so our commission and um, you know the residents, we believe the re residents of the city of Wyoming uh, understand and see a value in trees in the character that they put into our community, uh, the shade they provide in public spaces and on streets, um, the ability that these uh, street trees have to provide fresh air. Um, they also do services in reducing the amount of stormwater entering into our sewer systems. And um, they have value in, in providing uh, mental and physical well being, as well as financial benefits, which are sometimes kind of difficult to calculate, but they're definitely there. 
So one of the goals and main recommendations that we have in our document uh, for protecting trees during construction is um, just making sure that communication is highlighted uh, when we're discussing construction projects. Uh, we feel that it's gonna be important and letting the residents of the, of the city know uh, the importance the city places on trees. Um, also, communication is gonna be critical when we're discussing construction projects with contractors who are gonna be responsible for carrying out uh, these projects. Um, unless um, these standards and guidelines are written into the bid documents that uh, contractors receive and are included in the contracts for construction, um, there's no real way to hold contractors responsible for making sure that they're protecting um, you know, our street trees and public uh, trees in public spaces during construction. Uh, <clears throat> So one of the first recommendations in the document is to ensure that we have an ISA certified arborist uh, conduct a, a pre-construction inventory of all the trees within the limits of construction and um, that we have that consulting arborist provide recommendations for protecting trees uh, during the course of um, construction. Um, so any of the recommendations that an arborist makes should be included in the project plans, in the bid documents, and in the construction contract. Um, and we believe that those recommendations should be included in all projects that include um, street trees or other trees in public spaces. In the larger projects, we believe that those should be um, written into a full tree protection plan. Where possible, we believe that incorporating recommendations for tree protection um, into the bid documents is going to do uh, everything that we can um, that's possible to, to protect trees and, and basically um, provide an opportunity to, to prevent any damage during construction. One of the main recommendations that we uh, believe should be included are the ANSI A300 standards, which are a set of standards that are um, put forth by the American National Standards Institute and are, are considered um, industry standards for, for protecting trees during construction. Um, other specific guidelines that we believe should be included and are outlined in the document are things such as uh, setting up tree protection zones prior to construction that should stay in place throughout the entire course of construction until the project is complete. Um, we have uh, a recommendation in the document to keep construction equipment and materials out of the drip line of trees. Um, we understand that, you know, that isn't always possible, especially in street construction projects. So uh, wherever possible, um, when, when we're working on street construction projects, we're recommending that vehicles and equipment are parked on existing pavement uh, to prevent damage to, to tree roots and compaction around the trees. Um, with that, we would also like to see that there is um, no grading or other disturbance done within the drip line when, when possible. And again, we understand that there are more constraints during street construction projects than there would be in open spaces such as parks uh, and, and other um, more wide open spaces. Um, no tree removals should take place uh, other than those that are pre-approved by the consulting arborist and are written into the tree protection plan. Um, all pruning of limbs and roots greater than two inches 
need to be discussed with the consulting arborist. Um, also, any tree roots that are exposed during construction should be covered up as quickly as possible. And um, stump grinding of trees that have been removed, um, all efforts should be taken to limit disturbance to trees that are to remain. So basically, um, we are, we're requesting that the, um, the city council adopts the tree production during construction document that were uh, that we've provided to you, and we're requesting that the city write a resolution to approve um, this document uh, as something that they will use whenever possible um, and, and to to the fullest extent possible during construction projects. Um, are there any specific questions on the document that we've provided you or any of the background information uh, that Sherry discussed? Yeah, looking I have one at, the, looking at the construction experience that we've had with trees on existing streets such as Springfield Pike, right. would these recommendations clash with what's occurred historically? And if so, is it appropriate to they clash? Or is this perhaps uh, something more extreme than the construction contractors had in the uh, recent past, the last two or three years? Um, I, I don't believe that this is more extreme. Um, again, these are just recommendations that we're providing to the city that will give the city tools that could be included into the construction documents we believe we'll, we'll give the best opportunity for, for coming up with a plan prior to construction to prevent damage to trees as much as possible. Um, we understand that there are instances where trees are gonna have to be removed and trees are damaged during construction. And sometimes that's unavoidable, um, but we also believe that uh, with proper planning, we can do uh, more than we have in the past to protect trees during construction. I guess the one uh, question I have is, do you or anyone have like a ballpark figure of how much, if these recommendations were implemented, how much it would cost the city? Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell exactly how much, but I, I don't believe it would be a large percentage. Um, I, I believe that the the increased cost to construction would be minimal. You know, um, a lot of the street construction projects that you guys have going on are, are I'm sure, hundreds of thousands, if not uh, millions of dollars. And um, when you think about the value that trees provide to the community, uh, we believe that the additional cost added to projects would be relatively minimal. I can't give you an exact number and it's gonna be dependent on the size and the type of project, how many trees you have to protect uh, and the complexity of the project. Um, but we believe that it's a worthwhile endeavor. I'd like to say that some of these things we already do, the city does, they have a, the city has a certified arborist on staff and so that pre-construction survey is already done today on most street projects. And this is like I was saying, we, we do these, it's just not, it's not something that you have written down that you can show a, a resident to say, this is how we do it. This is the process that we use. Yeah. There is not so much of um, already in the plans to go over and protect the roots. There is in the sense of cutting of roots, but going back and putting exposed roots and soil on it, those are not done right now. Um, fencing a, a significant tree or a historic tree is not done right now. So those are where some extra costs might be. But in the protection of a big historic tree, um, it's easier to do when, we, when you're building a new rec center or doing addition to the rec center or something in the park like the Village Green. It's not so easy to do along a Mount Pleasant or a Vermont that's coming up. If if I can just jump into um, 
So a couple of things. I I went to a, a Taking Root seminar last January, and there was a lot of discussion there about from uh, professional tree people about construction damage to trees. And I was amazed at, you know, if you just park a pickup truck underneath a large tree, you will kill it um, just from the weight of the truck, which I had no idea. Um, and um, there are, uh, I'm not suggesting we do this, but there are municipalities that have sued construction companies for killing trees because um, they were able to quantify the value of the, the services that the trees provide. Um, and we, every time we have to replace a street tree that costs us money as a city. Um, but um, I also wanted to just add, because I have personal experience with road construction, living on Ritchie, um, that uh, tree roots were exposed for um, many months and, and they had to be exposed because the road was taken so far down but uh, one thing that frustrated me, and this was before I was on council um, as a resident, is that I was in the city building after the project ended and I noticed that we have a bunch of brochures about how to protect your trees during construction and you know that I should have been watering my trees during those hottest months when the roots were exposed. And that just wasn't ever communicated to residents on Ritchie. And you know, I know our staff is busy and I'm, I'm not blaming them, but I just think I think people on urban forestry, we all feel like this just needs to be amplified a bit more in the city. Like we need to think of our trees as a priority um, and including during these uh, construction projects and not as an afterthought. Um, and it's, I know it's hard to do because we have a small staff and, and all of that, but we are, you know, that's our, we are a tree city, we should, we should recognize the value of this. And, and we have this whole commission that's uh, focused on it. And these guys spent three years working on this. Um, and, and, and we all recognize that this is not, we're not asking for, a, or they're not asking for a, um, an ordinance, but you know, it's not enforceable in any way, but we're hoping going forward, especially with some of the, even these projects on Mount Pleasant or Vermont, that maybe it's done a little bit differently than it was on Ritchie and maybe some fewer trees will get lost um, in the process. And, and, and just lastly, I'll just add that I did, I did have an email exchange with Emily about if, if we had a resolution, she, could, she said if we decide to do that tonight, she can put one together. But I think the commission feels like that would be some recognition of the work that they've done and some recognition that city council um, feels like this is important. Yeah, um, I'm in support of what I've seen. I, I, I do question, my question is uh, the process of it being a resolution. Um, when I look at it, I, every time that we've uh, had a report to city council, we've uh, made a motion to accept the report and then we made a motion to adopt the report. Uh, so to me, this, I, I can't, I, I'm having a real hard time finding how this report goes into a resolution rather than staying into a, the, the uh, city council accepting it and then eventually adopting it. My other question is also is when, when I look and I need Mike and I need Rusty and if Terry's on the line, I'm hoping Terry can help me with this, is if I, when I look at the mechanisms of what this report is asking or recommending, I see this report uh, going to planning commission and working and the, this commission working with planning commission to begin to look at how you can infuse and begin to uh, one infuse all of these particular protections for trees and then how can you begin to implement those? And then how do you begin to enforce those? So, uh, so I see it, I see this, this whole protection process as a part of planning also, uh, because eventually in time, someone is going to, whether it's a highway uh, tree or whether it's a property tree, in my opinion, 
that's going to be brought to board and zoning appeals, if it cannot be handled administratively, then it's got to go someplace and it has to go someplace to be appealed, in my opinion. And I'm giving all of this in my opinion. So that's the reasoning of my thinking is, I'm not sure resolution fits, but I do understand accepting it as a report. I do understand adopting it, but I also would like to see the process go through planning commission so they could begin to have the conversation about how you infuse this into building codes, into architectural review, so when the, Ar when the ARB comes into place and they have a, a project to come to them, they have the recognition and the cognizance that there is a tree protection plan that they need to look at during the process of the ARB. So um, I hope you're kind of with me in that long <laughs> arborist response, but that's where I see it. Um, and I'll, I'll sit back, thank you. Hey, hey Al. Um... Thanks, and a little bit to Jim's point as well. I mean, I get, let me start with Jim on the uh, price, the the cost. We have incorporated probably ninety percent of these specifications on recent projects at the gardens and the rec center, so we've already felt the price on those. As far as street, uh, actual street construction projects, it was a we had to really work to try to make things practical. And, you know, there, there's always that balance we said. So in terms of, you know, in my mind, trying to administer these projects is flexibility, have the flexibility to each project's a little unique, has unique circumstances, and you need to incorporate what's appropriate or what's most appropriate. I, I view this document as almost a starting point as after a pr project or two that we would develop, um, you know, we'd look back and say, are there loopholes we let slide by? Or on the other hand, as Jim indicated, maybe there, there's a couple areas we're too strict. And so we we need to find that that good balance, I think. Um, lastly, before I get into Al's, uh, you, you touched on this, the resolution or the adopting a report. Uh, the, the board, the commission actually was wrestling with this as well. And I know I look back in the history, just for your information, the, I look back at Emerald Ash Bore when we did our report to council. In that case, the report was adopted and we implemented it as a, at a staff level. Different, different issue, different council, but I just, just for your information. Now, as far as you talked about the planning commission and I, I see what you're saying that the, I think that the commission, when they developed these recommendations, were thinking on public projects. And when you go into planning, you're, you're getting into more private stuff. And I think it's a great point that, you know, we, we got to show this culture of protecting trees in this community. And it, it goes beyond obviously just the public projects. It's anybody that works in the city, the contractors, It'd be nice if right now I don't know if they know how much we love our trees and maybe through this document and others we can we can get that across to them I I don't know the answer on the planning commission I don't know if Rusty or um, Megan would have any thoughts on that if she's if she's still on the line I'm here can you hear me yes okay thanks um I'm on a headset so when I think about planning commission involvement, I think of it from um, currently like the master plan uh, view of things. And if these recommendations were to be codified in some sense, then I could see how they would, um, you know, potentially become something that uh, like the board of zoning appeals may have a hand in. Mike and I talked about this over the course of the last few weeks, just the interfacing between urban forestry and public projects and then um, private development and how we can, as Mike said, encourage the culture of tree protection. Um, so if, as I understand these to be guidelines for public trees and public 
um, funded projects. Um, I like the idea of rolling this out at that scale and seeing, um, you know, learning what we can learn uh, and then seeing if there's a way to incorporate that into um, potentially the zoning code or things that would be more um, technically reviewed uh, for permitting. So at this point, the Planning Commission oversees the implementation of the master plan. And as you all are aware, tree protection um, and celebrating our trees is a, a key component of the master plan. So I see them having their hands in it uh, at that level. And then, you know, potentially at a, as we become more proficient, um, seeing if there's logical, reasonable ways of incorporating tree, pro pre tree protection into the zoning regs. Uh, I'd like to suggest that Rusty ask the city managers of other like communities, Hamilton County, what their experience has been I'd like to have uh, Terry Huxley informally ask Adelaide and other companies specialize in tree repair, what's been their experience with it? What would be tolerable and what would be uh, beyond uh, the norm for them? And with that input from other city managers and from an informal survey of potential uh, contractors, that would be very useful feedback in determining how we should approach it. I'm not saying we should immediately follow whatever pleading is. I'm not saying we should not do something just because a contractor doesn't like it. But it's very helpful to have that information. And it's Chair Lockman, before I write, before we have uh, a change to our uh, codified ordinances, I'd like to know what others have done and how do we do it relative to what they've done so that we're not going ahead of pace that a rationale for that. Hasn't you, haven't you guys already done that, spoken to? We have, we have gotten some information from other cities. Uh, we looked at Lebanon and Westerville. Um, I know, but we didn't contact Madeira, but um, both in talking with Jenny Gulick and Wendy Van Buren from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, um, our recommendations are not anywhere near as strict as they would have suggested. Um, trying to hold the, the contractors more um, accountable. We did not talk to any contractors. Um, we and we we also recognize it's hard to make them responsible. But if we don't put out very importantly to them, these trees are important to them. They park and load all their stuff underneath the tree. And it doesn't die for two years after the project is all done. It's hard to go back to that contractor. But if you tell them right up front, please protect our trees as best you can. We care. Then, then they won't park the tar truck there and they won't stack things against the tree because we might not know for two years that the tree really was suffered during that time. I, I think what's important, important Jim, it's just that you, you know this these guidelines. Someone, if you guys could mute if you're not speaking. I don't have. Um, I think what's important about the guidelines is get the city on the same page uh, about how we proceed with these projects in the future. Like, like uh, Megan and Mike both talked about. Um, you know, making sure that we're all on the same page how we're going to proceed in the future, doing what we can to make sure we're educating everybody, community, um, the construction workers, whoever it is, about making sure that the trees are a priority. Um, and this will allow us to do, to, to have those guidelines in place to do that. I can ask a question. In practical terms, what do we need in order to make sure that this effort that has taken multiple years and that is already 90% of the way being implemented, that it is done consistently on public projects. That, that seems to be what they're asking for right now. 
So is that a policy issue? Is that a resolution? Is that in the code? Do we need it in the code? Um, I, I've got, there are so many different options. Now I've gotten lost as to what, what discrete outcome would make this consistent. Well, I think one of the challenges we have is is if if you if you're going to make it completely consistent, if you're going to try to put it in ordinance, um, then we could run into some additional problems with some of these projects. Uh, what we've done now, or what they've done now, is put together these guidelines that people like Mike um, and Megan can then make sure part of these projects moving forward. Um, Mike can probably better explain that, but to, to put ourselves in a position where we are going to have to do certain things could dramatic, could then increase the cost of some of these projects to the point where uh, it becomes problematic. Um, it being a guideline is still going to allow the city some flexibility in how they're going to approach some of these projects. In terms of implementation, Mike or Megan or uh -huh. Misty, is there a difference between a resolution and adopting a report with the guidelines? I don't know that in effect there is a difference because uh, a resolution is not the same as um, codifying regulations through the form of an ordinance. Um, Right, but just accepting a report versus a resolution, the, the point that Al brought up in in actual day-to-day -day life, would, would there be a difference? As a staff person, I don't see the distinction that a resolution would, um, you know, particularly change the way in which this is rolled out or implemented. So I think of it parallel to the city council adopting um, the Historic Preservation Commission's design guidelines. So those are guidelines that uh, don't carry the force of um, law, but are a helpful tool to staff and community to try to do right by our historic district and historic properties. Um, one thing that I deal in is sidewalk repairs. And so a couple of years ago, Brad Bonham and um, Alex Taze from Urban Forestry had, and, and others, I hopefully don't uh, intentionally leave anybody out of that, but had come to the community development staff and worked with us to update and upgrade our sidewalk replacement project manual. So a lot of the suggestions, recommendations um, in this body of work are currently captured in our sidewalk repairs. Um, I will say it is a challenge to monitor. So we have a challenge having our contractors show up consistently. So um, it, it's just a baseline. And as you guys know, we're a lean staff. So we do our best of you know keeping these projects rolling on time and on budget. So um, I see there are elements here that we will be incorporating into the sidewalk project manual um, in addition to what we've already adopted. And then the challenge will be like when the rubber hits the road that we're able to kind of monitor or police it effectively. What I would like to, and I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna weigh in. What I would like to have, um, and again, I support this. What I would like to have is I would like it not be a resolution. I would like for it to be a report that we accept and report to re adopt. In addition to what has been in addition to what's been presented to us, what I think the one leg on this stool that's missing is an implementation process. And I'm not asking for a codified guide, but I'm asking for an implementation that, that uh, when a street and road project is in the process of being bidded or, or, or finalized, that the contractor will be given the following things which are related to tree care and maintenance and tree and the consideration of placement of equipment and tree protection zones. That's what I would like to have. I would like to have that when a contractor comes to the city and makes an application 
that that along with a checklist of everything else that that contractor gets, that he will be given that document and he will make sure that he understands that document. We don't have any, we have no teeth in this, but I, but I would like to have that kind of implement, implementation process. My reasoning for that is that when you come back later and you say to me as a city council member, you say, I would like to have this codified and I would like to have this part of the ARB recommendations to be not considered, but to be enforced. Now you have, you can come back and say to me, this is where we presented it. This is how we spoke to it. And this is the outcome of what we received. That gives me, that gives you data and it gives me data that I have, that I have, that I can make a considerable and an informative decision. That's where I am. That's the difference. I understand. I appreciate the resolution. I just see it more of a hallelujah with that because there's not that implementation process. I do see uh, without, I don't want to be redundant. You understand what I'm saying. I hope if you don't, then please ask me a question. I don't think anyone on UFBC would have a problem with it not being a resolution. I'm not obviously that experienced on council and that was just um, an idea we were throwing around and Emily didn't really object, but I think your points are well taken. Um, I think everything you said was <laughs> very well put. So um, I don't want to speak for UFBC, but that's, um, I like the idea of having an implementation piece and then I guess seeing how well that works. Now that I said it, I need somebody to respond to me and either tell me I'm part crazy or this is a, or this will be workable administrative wise, Megan, Rusty and Mike, I, you know, uh, or any council member. Uh, I, I think the, the administration part is, is extremely important now. And I think that's where, um, if you go back to the original reason that this was brought up, it comes back to the communication piece from back in the beginning. And it's about making sure that administratively that we have a process when it comes to these things and that we follow that process. So I, your idea of, of making an administrative part of this is, is, a, is an important part. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Rusty, that that was, when we were putting the document together that we we had some of that and we had, and then some of it was specifications which contractor you know we it was like we were going to put in the contract documents that they must comply with and and so i think to make that more clear add some clarity to that is is uh, and and make sure we uh document how we do that makes sense to me are other people comfortable with the proposal put forward by al I think this sounds like a very good idea. Um, I am curious with this, so it sounds like it would be an implementation document given to um, contractors, construction companies. Is there also kind of an implementation document? It sounds like there is a working document or a communication on the city side when there are these projects. We have that too. I think it's just, I think we need to just um, maybe add to it the implement, uh, implementation, like, like Al said, I think that's the, maybe the piece that needs more detail in it and how we're, how we're going to do that. But other, you know, I think that you know, at least in my opinion, the documents, you know, pretty, pretty full. I think as, as we move forward, the staff will just, you know, this is, has been accepted or adopted um, and we'll just have to make sure that we come up with the process that the, the way to administrate this as part of the process and make sure that they're getting the correct documents and as much as possible have staff following through with the construction companies as the process moves forward. Thank you. 
do you want the our board to try to turn this into an implementation plan or do you want that to be the public works and megan and group um what i would like for you to do a brief presentation at city council therefore you don't have to go into as extensive of a detail as you did but i'd like you to do a brief presentation at city council and recommending for city council to accept the report which would include the implementations which i have great confidence that mike and megan and uh and any one of your members uh, would certainly help uh, build those implementation processes. And then at the next council meeting, that would allow us to accept your report and then adopt your report along with the implementations and then be able to speak to those. Okay. Any other comments before we move on to the next item on the agenda? <laughs> Sherry, Thanks. if you could stop sharing your screen for me, that way sure. I can. There you go. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're moving on now to our third item, which is, as I mentioned before, uh, the replacement of Mr. Irreplaceable. And uh, I will, at this point, uh, turn it over to Jeff so he can kick off any comments he wants to share with us. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I didn't really have any comments planned, nothing, nothing to say that we could all get emotional about or anything like that. You know, uh, I gave this a lot of thought. It's very bittersweet for me, you know, I, I ran for council three years ago to serve the community. And I, I wanted to put my heart and all into that. I feel like I have, uh, I understand it's a volunteer job. I'm not sure everybody in the community realizes that. I know that everybody on this call does, but you know, I had an interesting conversation with someone uh, last week about who's on this call, Mr. Herzog, about how people treat volunteers and you know, the last, I don't know, six months or so have been very challenging for me personally. I have had uh, people who I don't even know in the community come up to me and, and say things they've heard about me or make accusations about me. And, you know, I've, to a certain extent, I've always let that type of stuff slide off. But on the other hand, at this point in my life, I feel like I've worked very hard for my name and my reputation. And to have, like we all have, and to have people that I don't even know hear things or say things or make up things, um, it, it really, it, it really got me thinking about why am I doing this? And, you know, last week I was gone two days up in Wisconsin for reserve duty. I had three other evening calls for my new Army Reserve job. And so I only have so much time and energy in the day. I'm just being very transparent with everybody. And, and it got to the point where I'm happy to do what is required for city council, but the other noise was really becoming a distraction in my life. And when I found out totally transparently without giving any details that another council member was partly behind it, it was very offensive to me. And, um, I, I intervened in that and I'll just say that that has been handled and it stopped, but I didn't appreciate that. And at this level where we're running in a nonpartisan race and we're all neighbors, I would like to think we could be above that. And I would hope going forward that uh, that's a good lesson from the last few months. We're all supposed to be friends and neighbors working for the common good of our small town, our small city and community. And to have people out there who, who are deliberately misleading others for whatever reason, I don't know, and I really don't care, just was not what I was about. And so uh, I made the decision. Um, what I said in my email was that I would stay through December 31st. Um, I hadn't really thought about the whole transition with the city manager. Um, 
I don't know how it works to find a replacement member for council, but I'm, I'm happy to stay until there's a new city manager uh, rather than to make it two complicated processes at the same time. But I, I do understand that me leaving before the end of the term, I've let some people down. I'm not fulfilling a commitment that weighs on me. I'm not like that. I feel to a certain extent I'm quitting and I apologize for that. And um, those of you on the call here uh, looking at the names, I mean, I consider you an extended family and it's been great working with you. And I feel we've done a lot of good. And I hope that whoever comes behind me, I know whoever comes behind me will be someone who will pick up and do even better things working with you going forward. So I'm excited about that. But with that, Mr. Mayor, that's the best I can do off the top of my head. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, sir. That was very impressive. Um, I, some folks may want to talk now. I'm going to save it for uh, the December uh, City Council meeting, my, my comments. But uh, if folks want to uh, give comments now, they're more than welcome. I'd like to thank Jeff for an excellent uh, commentary just now and for the work you put in many hours uh, over many months. We very much appreciate it. Learning from previous appointments has been that the consensus person, not the person who's sharply on the edge, but the consensus person is the appropriate person. If the voters want to go to an extreme, the voters can go to an extreme. But right now, to fill the gap, we should do the consensus middle of the road, if you will, and let the voters later decide how radical or how extreme they wish to be in voting for the 20th. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jeff, I, I, I will say something later, but you know, I've always, I've always re appreciated you. I appreciated your thought process. And what I've always liked is your ability that you and I can go at each other, but then come back and, and pretty much look at each other and smile and know that there's more than that to our relationship. And that's, you know, that means a lot to me uh, because um, I always think the honor in a person is the ability to argue, discuss and get disgusted but then the honor and ability is to not take it personal and understand that there's more to it than what that initial conversation is about. Because at the end, respecting what you said and showing honor to you is being, again, your friend again. And that's what I hope I've been able to do through our relationship with you, because I certainly have seen it from you to me. And I, that's the one thing I want to thank you about. Um, I have a question, and the question is, uh, your initial, uh, re you wanted to resign December the 31st, um, and you now you said you'd like to go, you, 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 you have no problems going on into the time of hiring a new city manager. I don't think that we'll be able to finalize this process. I'm going to give you my opinion only, it's, it's not based on nothing. I think that for us to think that we're going to make a decision by March is going to be ambitious. So what I'm asking you is when you begin to look at possibly going into April and even the 1st of May, is that a commitment that you want? And is that, if that commitment is, is, is. It looks like my Wi-Fi keeps locking up. Yeah. Well, I hope it catches me smiling rather than frowning. But uh, is that the is that the commitment that you want? Sometimes you make it, you know. Sometimes you make a decision and you're locked into that decision, and then you you rethink it. I want you. I, I don't Mac, want to talk to you my Wi-Fi disconnected there through April and now. Um, well, how long does it take to replace or to find a replacement for a council member? What do you think that timeline looks like? Could that be a we matter have, of weeks? We have a thirty day responsibility from the date of your resignation. Right, Rusty? Yeah, 30 days. Right. Correct, uh, we, we have 30 days, that's correct. Okay, yeah, April or May is another six months, Alan. First of all, thank you for your kind words. I, I reciprocate them, I totally agree. And I've appreciated your candor and your thinking and your cooperation um, and also your wisdom. 
I mean, I've come to you a lot of times in confidence and on the side to get your perspective and you've, you've never let me down on that. So I appreciate that. Um, I don't think I'd be willing to stay six more months. I was thinking the end of February, probably at the longest. Um, I, I'm just getting, you know, is it, it with the, I was not prepared to, ex my new army job is a lot of travel. Um, I was gone last weekend for, I left Saturday morning at seven o'clock and I landed last night at 1130 PM and was gone one night to Fort Hood, Texas. And so I will probably have more of that coming up uh, with the vaccine on the horizon. Uh, I can see it ramping up even more. So probably the end of February would be the extent I would say. Um, I'm going to chime in and try not to cry again, and I'll, I will likely have more to say whenever it is your final month, as I think we're negotiating right now, but um, getting to know you through counsel was one of the most moving experiences of doing this. There are a lot of times we don't agree on big political issues. But knowing you and being your friend and working together showed how often a group of people who are neighbors can collaborate and find solutions for the people around them. And that's the power of government. That's the most meaningful piece of it. That's why even when things are awful, I still want to do this. And it breaks my heart knowing that that was broken in a way for you. And I think moving forward, we owe that mutual, mutual support for each other um, as we go ahead and whoever the next person is, and I hope you decide that it'll just, you know, last until next December, but, um, Barring that, I just want to say thank you um, for being part of serving our community and putting our community first, which is what you do. And that's what we all need to do. Yeah, I appreciate that, sir. You know, from our first meeting at the Troubadour Vault three years ago, I guess it's now, you know, I've, I've really appreciated being your friend and your partner. You know, I, I would, you know, Rusty asked me what feedback I would give going forward. And I'll just share this. And this is not level with anybody on this call, but there were times when I felt like I was the person without a home. I was telling Sarah this earlier. If you think about it, and I'm just being totally transparent, um, there were, there, there's, there's one group of counsel that, and this is not, I'm not criticizing, had a slate and there were five people identified with one party and that party has their back. I think that's fantastic. On the other hand, there's another person who's lived here his whole life for generations and has a whole lot of networking in the community. And, and that's on the other side. And then there was me kind of in the middle and I went to events on both sides. I went to the Wyoming Democrats over at the barn and I went to things with another member of council at people's homes. And what I found out was trying to bridge both sides was I really didn't bridge anything. I got arrows from both sides. Um, when I was with the left, the right was after me. When I was with the right, the left was after me. And, and as a result on the street, uh, I really didn't have that many friends. So uh, I think going forward, uh, um, everybody talks about how they wanna work together in bipartisanship in the community and the country. and and I would ask people who say that to really think about what they mean, um, because I didn't I didn't find that a whole lot, not from this group, but from out in the community, from the people who I didn't know. Unfortunately, I've had so many Freedom of Information Act requests for my personal cell phone. I think I've had three just for me. I mean, that the time it takes to go back and look for every conversation. Anyway, you all understand it was and that's just in the last couple months. So people can post stuff about me on Facebook. I mean, whatever. It was, it was, I didn't understand that. Not at this level, you know?
Not at this level. Anyway, I'm a, now. Oh, I, I just want to say, Jeff, that. Um, fine, Jeff. <clears throat> so, sorry, that is, if you want to go no, ahead. No. Um, I, I'm just really sorry that um, you've been treated that way. Um, I think it's been a really challenging year. Um, since it's the only year I've been on council, I can't compare it to other years. Um, but I've always um, appreciated that you're um, a moderate Republican. Uh, um, I like to say you're the Mitt Romney of, of Wyoming. <laughs> uh, I hope that that's not an insult. Um, and, and campaigning and, and asking people to vote for you. Um, I did come across people who would absolutely not vote for Republican. And of course I didn't knock on too many Republicans doors. So the, probably the same sentiment would have been given to me, but I did, you know, try to tell people and, and I wish they had listened that um, you were one of the good ones. <laughs> um, and, and of course I didn't know you that well, but I was going after um, I trust Sarah and, and I knew you guys had a special relationship. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm sorry that I won't get to work with you more because um, I think you and I probably agree on most things um, for the city um, as most people here tonight. I think we all agree. We're all pretty reasonable people. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's been a hard year and I'm sorry um, but I understand. Um, I've had the same thoughts at times, but. Yeah, I think we talked about that, Nancy. So yeah, I, I've really appreciated your friendship and your partnership from the campaign and forward. Uh, it's been great to have people to talk with and commiserate with. Uh, I'm, it's funny to hear you call me the Mitt Romney of Wyoming. I, I, on the street, I'm more commonly called a socialist. That's the latest term for me that I, I mean, okay. But uh, I've had that thrown at me a couple times in the last month. Um, or I, I guess the quote was, I've heard you have an interest in socialism. Mm, I don't yeah. know. Okay. So um, I'm probably not the only one here who's had that. But yes, yeah, so I, I, I really appreciate everything. And I'm going to miss you guys a lot. I really will. I really will. Um, and there's a lot of things left on the table that I, I wanted to do. Um, but I think this right decision for me and for my family at this time. I'm haunted though by words Al that Barry said in an interview. He said it was in, uh, I don't know if it wasn't on What's Up Wyoming. It was one of the magazines. He said, a lot of people come to council and stay only two terms because once they find out what's, what it's about, they don't want anything to do with it. And I thought, oh, that's not going to be me. That's not going to be me. And here I am. I didn't even make it to two terms. So. Yep. All right. Unless you all can, in the next 40 days, work some magic on Jeff, here's the outline we have set up for the timeline for uh, appointing uh, someone else. You want to put, take, put it up there, Rusty? Yeah. By the way, Rusty, the only person still to reach out when the agenda was posted was Jim. So that tells you how many people read the agenda or how many <laughs> kids, I don't know. Gotcha. And I All don't right. need counsel. We were talking, Rusty and I were talking about other people in the community might reach out. I said, oh, so so here, here's our current timeline with, and this is with the, um, with uh, Jeff's resignation effective December 31st. Um, keeping in mind, we have to have an appointment within 30 days. Um, this was a press release announcement on January 4th. Um, we would accept applications until January 11th at 5 p.m. Um, we would then, as staff would turn those applications and resumes around to the council members the next day on the 12th. Um, and then we would want you to, um, 
and this is still somewhat up in there, how exactly we would rank or you would rank those applications. But then those rankings would be due back um, by the 19th at noon so that we could com then compile them. And then that night and council and executive session, you would discuss the candidates and come up with three candidates to interview based on those rankings. Those interviews would take place in special council meetings on the 20th and 21st. And then uh, we would have a special council meeting the 25th before the committee of the whole meeting in which um, you would, uh, we would swear in the new council member. And this, this happened last just three years ago, right? I think didn't Mike, Mike Iman was appointed, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so any questions on that timeline? Okay. All right. You guys got 40 days to work on Jeff. Mr. Mayor. Right. We'll, move, we'll, move, we'll move on to miscellaneous. Uh, any comment, any miscellaneous, Nancy? No. Sarah? No. Jim? Al? None. Thank you. Jeff? No, sir. All right. Now, I wasn't blowing you all off. As you should, may, may know, I'm here in the land of the morning calm, and that's why I take my, when I get the internet unstable, that's why I put my picture up there, because um, sometimes it, I lose out on connectivity. So, nonetheless. And, and what time is it there? I'm going to have brunch, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock <laughs> on Tuesday. So I have my lunch waiting here for me. I cannot leave my room. Where, where are you, that is? Korea. I'm on the outskirts of Seoul. Seoul from the outskirts. I'm in quarantine, government quarantine. I cannot leave my room for 14 days. Just stay uh -huh. here like a caged animal. All right. And then I get to go <laughs> to downtown Seoul and abide for it. Eight days. I get to abide. I'm teaching law students. They have um, Korean law, law students who want to take the American bar. So I'm, I'm over here for the University of Dayton and I'm going to uh, teach them. Yeah. This isn't a DC National Guard goes to Korea thing. No, no, no. It's uh, University of okay. okay. All right. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Second. <laughs> All right. We are adjourned. Take care. Have a good Thanksgiving. We'll see you. See you. Thanks. See you.